Okay, perfect. All right, you guys, we are on. So, um, hi, everybody. I'm going to turn the comments off. Just um, I'm going to hide them from the screen and tell a quarter tell so that I don't have their beautiful faces covered up. Um, and then we'll and then I'll open it up for questions. So hit that. Oops, not that. Questions. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Nikki. Hi, hello. If you haven't met me before, I'm a uh, recovery and life transition coach in Phoenix and a yoga instructor. This is my third interview uh, of my functional medicine series. Dr. Mark Force has been with me from the start. Um, and Dr. Hannah Conry, his daughter, they're in practice together, joined us last week. And now we're all here together again. So they're in family practice. And I'll just say one more thing. They've got another daughter coming up, I believe, training yeah. as well. Right. So it's totally amazing. And they're in um, Ashland, Oregon. Um, you know, I think I have a few little bios, but I think I liked what we did last week where you just take a moment to introduce yourselves and tell, you, tell everybody about your practice and who you are. Okay, you can go first. Okay. So I've been in practice for 36 years and I love it as much as ever, if not even more so. And, um, and my, my, my area of expertise is in, in combining or fusing together and synthesizing conventional medicines, diagnostic approaches with uh, natural approaches to healthcare. Um, applied kinesiology is, is kind of the overarching theme, but what it's do doing is bringing all of that stuff together under one cover. So there's chiropractic and there's, there's osteopathic techniques, including cranial sacral work, and there's Chinese medicine techniques and approaches and then there's naturopathic techniques there's um, homeopathy herbal medicine clinical nutrition all of those things under under one cover under one approach and it's one of the things that makes it really great is that we're able to find out what that person needs instead of having just a couple of tools that we have to work with and make those fit whatever that person is coming in with we are really able to bring together whatever is appropriate for that person um, and use use what is their best fit you know, from all those different techniques. And um, it's really beautiful. You know, you get to see people in the beginning where you, you go through all the lab work and you see where they are. And then, you know, six, 12 weeks later, you go through and do all the exams and lab work again and see what you've changed. And it's really, you're, it's a beautiful thing, you know. So that's me. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so I am a second generation chiropractic physician. Uh, Dr. Force's mm -hmm. daughter. I helped run his clinic for 10 years in Arizona and did the whole back office patient education, patient exams, and was really inspired by everything that he was doing with his patients. At the time, I was doing a bunch of different things, kind of dabbling and trying to decide, you know, what I wanted to do ultimately. Um, originally, my path was to become an international business lawyer. And I ended up spending a summer working for my father and stayed. <laughs> I never left and went to school. I ruined yeah. it for her. I invited her to work for the summer. And that, yep. that destroyed her. Yeah, I, I just, nice, I nice it. ploy. Yeah, yeah. So then I went on to do some um, dance therapy training, a 500 hour yoga certification, a doula, birth doula. And then I was training to be a midwife, a home birth midwife, worked with a midwife for three years in Arizona, and then decided that it was time to just jump in and do what my dad does and follow in his footsteps. So um, it was a meandering path to get here, but I feel like everything kind of led to the culmination yeah. of this point and all of the experience and background that I have really tailors the work that I do now. Um, so my focus is really on more family oriented practice, um, prenatal, pregnancy, pediatrics, early family dynamics, that sort of thing. Uh, and I, in addition to that, I use all of the same tools that Dr. Force does with the applied kinesiology and the craniosacral work and the meridian therapy, clinical nutrition, the whole gamut. Yep, that's us. So I'll backtrack <laughs> and talk about myself just a little bit more just to give background for people listening in. Yes, um, please. Is that um, I've lecture I've for many many years I've, I've taught both um, lay people and physicians um, in the last few years it's been all physicians that have been teaching um, the approaches in terms of applied kinesiology craniosacral work um, acupuncture and also clinical nutrition 
And um, I've been involved in standard process laboratories and Biox Research Corporation for many, many years. I've done a lot of clinical outcome studies. And I, a lot of those studies have led to use patents for various formulas that we developed. And so I've been involved in that world for a long, long time. Recently, I have a patent for a formula for methylation and chemical intolerance. And so I'm you know, familiar with those worlds as well. And the last couple of years, I've been lecturing around the country uh, to docs on central sensitization, which is a process of degenerative changes in the central nervous system related to these imbalances, chronic imbalances in neurotransmitters. So, Which has a tie-in with the whole topic for today. Yep. So, so he's well-versed in all that's, of this. That's my background. Yeah. <laughs> this is so awesome. This is so awesome. Um, well, I will also say that um, I can attest, number one, obviously, these guys are the real deal. It's really amazing. And I've been to their, um, Dr. Mark Force used to practice in Phoenix, which is where we met. And um, they have, their office is amazing. And I'm sure it's even grown more as far as equipment and testing and all that yeah. kind of stuff goes. It's really impressive. Um, I will say that um, today's topic, which is depression, anxiety, and bipolar, um, is very personal to me. It's what brought me to uh, see Dr. Force in the first place. It's what brought, brought me to Phoenix, Arizona, was a, a self-imposed, um, basically, intensive outpatient treatment program for depression. Um, there was substance abuse, of course, but underlying was a, a biochemical imbalance that was really um, devastating. And it was really um, affecting my life in a way that I had to move to another state and find doctors and help. So he was my introduction to functional medicine. Um, and I was very inspired to continue learning about nutrition, yoga, fitness, acupuncture, all of those, so many things that he mentioned and combining them to, to find wholeness, to heal, heal the whole system, which is what functional medicine is about. Um, I was very opposed to going to a um, psychiatrist or a psychiatric physician and just getting handed a pill. Um, I just wanted to try everything else first before I went that route, um, which I don't discourage. I'm just saying this is a really effective way to find your baseline and then go from there in an organic way. Um, so today we're talking about depression, anxiety, and bipolar. And I think I'll just maybe let you guys talk about what they are from a functional medicine perspective. Do you, do you want to start with a question? <laughs> well, that's yeah, a you know, I mean, <laughs> well, I think I think that kind of is my question from a functional medicine perspective. What is a mood disorder? You know, these um, they also often call it depression and anxiety. They just kind of refer to it that as that, but they also yeah. you have to put disorder after bipolar. And for me, I've always been di diagnosed with a mood disorder, um, yeah. and I just wanted you to speak to that. So, so you have to look at it in the bigger context. So, a mood disorder is is summarily it's it's related to an imbalance in the central nervous system right and its workings but where that comes from can be can be structural it can be chemical and it can be emotional or it can be all of those things like the triad of health that we yeah. talked about last week so it's still related to the triad of health like we know that if there's a lot of uh structural biomechanical issues that feeds afferent and abnormal information into the central nervous system that results in overstimulation of the central nervous system can create in chronic inflammation there, breakdown of the, of the system, what's called transneuronal degeneration actually of nerves where they start to break down and die. And that's the summation of nociception. Yeah. You know, feeling as though they're, you know, you're getting poked over and over and over yeah. to the point where the nerves start to degenerate and die. Yeah. So from overstimulation, they can actually break break down. And certain parts of the brain can break down, and that's that then results in mood disorders and other other issues that relate to breakdown of the way the central nervous system is working. And it can come from biochemical stress again, biochemical stress, physical stress, emotional stress, all of those things. The sum of those things, you know. So oftentimes, it's the sum of the, all of those stresses that are just too much, you know. Okay. And a person can't juggle it anymore. Their systems can't juggle it anymore. No. And then there are hereditary components yeah. as well that play into that. There are very strong genetic uh, predispositions to these things. And so a big part of what I'm doing these days with people is if, if we're looking at real chronic um, issues of, of, of depression and bipolar disorder, I look at the 23andMe data and we curate the genetics. So I know exactly what enzymes I need to look at um, and modify the expression of to make a change. And it really makes a difference to know that because then I can be really, really targeted. Mm -hmm. And then it, it improves the quality 
of everything that we do, you know, in terms of then knowing what lab work we need to do, what, what nutrition we need to do, it'll all, and what I need to test with the applied kinesiology ends up being direct from what we know about the genetics. And, you know, as a yeah. personal testament to that, we ran genetics on myself. Mm -hmm. um, I have always had trouble sleeping. Ma huge insomnia issues, never been able to stay asleep, trouble getting to sleep, the whole gamut. Uh, we ran the genetics on me, and I have an MAOA defect, which means that I don't clear epinephrine and norepinephrine, adrenalines, all of that, the way that I'm supposed to. Mine only operates at 16% of normal, <laughs> which means that I maintain that hypervigilance constantly right? I'm just driving. I'm constantly going. And actually, this defect is termed the warrior gene, because <laughs> those are the people who just push nonstop, right? They're always doing. They never sit down. They never rest. Um, but riboflavin made all of the difference for me. One missing nutrient, and I can sleep. And we have, so it's amazing how huge the yeah. change can be for people, how effective that can be. It can be transformative. Once you understand the specific, gene, the specific genes and the specific enzymes, and you know what to target, oftentimes you can make these miraculous changes with a single nutrient, whether it's a mineral or a vitamin or some other factor. It's, it's amazing. And that's that functional medicine piece. Yeah. And then with the tie-in of the applied kinesiology, you know, knowing what nutrition uh, you know, box you're going for, but then being able to really pinpoint for that individual the specifics of what they need. You know, we carry like six, seven different kinds of thiamine in the yeah. office because different ones for different makeups. Okay, I have a couple of things to say in response to that and then we can go in deeper into some of those areas. One, I don't think that you are, I'm almost sure you were not doing 23andMe testing when I was no. with you. Well, I, hadn't, I hadn't incorporated that yet. Yeah, I don't even think it was. So really it makes a huge difference to have that. Yeah, so that's um, super interesting. It'd be interesting to go back now and kind of look at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll make it I think maybe I will do that. I think I'll get okay. a test and send it to you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Um, so speaking to that, when you're looking, so let's, I guess, talk about neurotransmitters. You're looking at the 23andMe, you're looking at the little markers that are showing that you might be deficient or at risk or, or however you said it, right. um, Dr. Conry. Um, let's talk about Let's talk about different trans neurotransmitters and what they do. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> I know there's a lot of them, but maybe the, we'll main, ones, the main ones that are dealt so, that are talked about. I'm sorry? Maybe just the main ones that are talked about the most in the um, well, world. Yeah, let's cover. There, there are lots, but we'll cover the, the main ones. The main ones are the catecholamines, which are dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. So those are the catecholamines. Hold on, I think there's a little the, ice. There's something going on in the background, I think. So yeah, that's, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I just couldn't hear Dr. Force. Okay, yeah, and, well, say so, that again. So I'll say that again. There are the catecholamines, which are dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. There are some subgroups in there, but those are the primary ones. And then there's serotonin. And then there's a derivative of serotonin, which is melatonin. So melatonin is made from serotonin. And then, and then you have histamine. Most people don't typically think of histamine as a neurotransmitter, but it's a really important one. And so when it's too high, it's very, very excitatory, and it can really overstimulate the system and cause a lot of problems, especially with the autonomic nervous system. So that's another one. Then there's, a, there's acetylcholine, which runs the relaxation response. It runs the, the parasympathetic nervous system. It's cholinergic. Um, and then you have the- um, I'm sorry, you guys, but there's a lot of, the noise is just picking up really well. Okay. Sorry about that. It's okay. I just so want to hear you. So um, then, then we have the we have glutamate and GABA, and glutamate and GABA are really interesting. They're actually something that we'll talk about more relative to bipolar disorder, and because you have you have glut glutamate is the most excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, and the spinal cord, and it is the precursor for GABA, which is the most inhibitory neurotransmitter. Oh, so bipolar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That whole discussion on balance that we had last time, again, uh -huh. it's another system regulated on balance. Exactly. So, so the, having the right glutamate to, ga to GABA ratio is really, really important. And there's one enzyme that is in between those two. It's called glutamic acid decarboxylase, or GAD. And a lot of people have the polymorphism for that that makes it difficult for them to convert glutamate to GABA. And so they have a high glutamate to low GABA ratio and they're constantly overstimulated. 
and it ends up frying their circuits. So Those what, are the chronic fatigue people, the fibromyalgia yeah. people. Yeah. And so I spent, uh, I, like I say, the last few years, I've, I've lectured around the country about central sensitization and this issue. And central sensitization is this chronic state of overexcitation in the limbic system of the brain, which is like the switching station for the brain. It's where everything that comes in gets distributed out to the outer part of the brain and then it comes back to the, to the switching station, the limbic system, and then goes out to the rest of the body. And so that's an area that has a lot of activity anyway. And then you overstimulate it, and then it, it, there's, it, it gets so much stimulation that it starts to break down. And then it, that system is involved in a lot of different things. It has to do with memory, and it has to do with focus, and it has to do with uh, your mental clarity. It has to do with controlling the autonomic nervous system. It has to do with circadian rhythms. All these different things are controlled by it. Even emotions are controlled by it. And so when it gets overstimulated and starts to break down, depending on what part of that system starts to break down more, you have sy symptoms that vary from one person to the other, even though the process is, is pretty much the same. And um, so it's a real central thing to bipolar disorder because in bipolar disorder, you have this, you have this chronic over, you have this overstimulation that tends to ramp up and it reaches a certain point that you crash because you fried your circuits, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then you have a certain period of time where in, you're in that low phase and then it starts building up again and then you crash again. That's because, that manic depression yeah. cycle. Wow. And so, so scientifically described, you know, it's like, yeah, there, I mean, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of controversy about that. And there are things that modify how that gets expressed, but more and more of the model is coming to around glutamate and GABA and the balance between those. And there's something called an NMDA receptor in the limbic, system of the brain and in the spinal cord that seems to be real central to this and so getting getting the nmda receptors regulated properly so that they have the right tone is really important to the whole system working right to, to have the whole system be calibrated right so, so if, if you talking about this um specific situation yeah. um, you would just decide based on those test results and you know, what the person's lifestyle is at that moment, what sort of treatment you want to do, acupuncture, obviously nutrition, obviously substance. Yeah, substance. so the, what the, way they, the way they all work complement in, in complement with one another is there's the genetic component that has to do with the person's expression of their chemistry, their body chemistry, right? And then you can use targeted nutrition to, to upregulate or downregulate certain enzymes to get them in, a, in the range where they need to be so the system can function properly. So that's the, that's the chemistry part. So that's usually it's clinical nutrition, but it can be herbal medicine or it can be homeopathy. It's usually, it's usually clinical nutrition that we do for that. And then you have the physical component, which is the chiropractic and the craniosacral work and other physical medicines that we do in acupuncture. And what those do is they, they calibrate the afferentation, they calibrate the information that's going into the brain. So it, it makes sense. So it's all, con it's all congruent and the central nervous system can relax. What yeah. happens is that when you have this, this discordant information feeding into the brain, then the brain ramps up trying to make sense out of this information that doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it's the analogy that I use, it's real similar to your computer when it's, com when it's going through calculations and all of a sudden you hear the computer go and it ramps up and it gets hot and all this stuff. That's what your brain's doing when it's trying to make sense out of this information coming into your body that doesn't make sense. And that's why, that's why things like chiropractic and craniosacral work and acupuncture and related techniques can modify the way the nervous system works, the central nervous system works is because and of that. looking at it from a chiropractic perspective, you're looking at, you know, the nervous system, there's um, a breakdown through the spinal column, right? Where we have the cervical and the pelvic area is parasympathetic. Yeah. That's where the parasympathetic nerves come from. So if we're focusing on getting someone out of, you know, that fight or flight state, relaxing their nervous system, that's where we're gonna focus our adjusting is gonna be on the cervical and the pelvic regions. Now, if we're just trying to, you know, balance someone, generally we'll do it all. Yeah. But then if you're looking at someone who is more in that depressed state, you might focus more on adjusting thoracics and lumbars. Yeah. You know, so you look at you look at all of those different pieces that tie in depending on where the individual's at. Because the thoracic and lumbar uh, correlates more to sympathetic. 
that's where the okay, sympathetic. So parasympathetic yeah. down here, sympathetic up here. Oh, oh, oh yeah. that's interesting. So, yeah. just so people top and bottom know. are parasympathetic, and in the middle is the sympathetic. So a lot of you know. Before we go on, like, before we go yeah. on, some people don't know the difference between parasympathetic. They don't even know what it is. Parasympathetic oh, okay. is basically rest and restore sympathetic. Right, rest, life. digest, relax. And then the uh, sympathetic is more that fight or flight, you know, ready to make a move. That's when we're exercising, we're more sympathetic dominant, that sort of thing. But Which actually people are exercise is amazing because you're sympathetic while you're doing it, but it actually upregulates the parasympathetic tone afterwards. No, that's really interesting. I mean, I know that I have to exercise and I know how great I feel mentally, emotionally, everything afterwards. So that's really, yeah, to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off before, Dr. Force. What were you going to say? What was I talking about? <laughs> well, we were talking about, we just where, we're talking about where on the spine the different. Uh, oh, okay. So, yeah, Hannah mentioned, uh, Dr. Connery mentioned that. Um, so, oftentimes we're adjusting the, the ends of the spine, the, the pelvis and the lower lumbar spine. And then we're adjusting the upper cervical and doing the craniosacral work. So doing the craniosacral work has a big effect on the autonomic nervous system. And then so does adjusting the ends of the spine in terms of increasing parasympathetic tone, which is what most people need. Yeah. Nine, nine out of 10 people, they need more tone in their parasympathetic nervous system to relax them. You know, they're, they're yeah. too, they're we're too, too amped up. They're too amped up. <laughs> what did you yeah. say? Nine out of 10 people? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Nine out of 10. That's a conservative estimate. <laughs> <laughs> 99 out of 100. Yeah, yeah. that's more like it. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, okay, so let's talk a little bit then. We talked a kind of about the neurotransmitters that correlate with bipolar a little bit more. Yeah. Can we talk about um, the depression, ones that more serotonin specifically, and then the ones that go more along with, um, well, I know there's uh, dopamine and all those, but let's talk about depression and then anxiety. Yeah, so, so there's 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 different types of depression there's 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 anxious depression and then there's just the the low mood depression the the, the um, i'm trying to think of the right word for it but where there's there's just no stimulus there's no stimulation the system is just shut down altogether and then you have the depression that's associated with anxiety too so that it's a mix of different tran neurotransmitters so like i said there's a lot of controversy about bipolar disorder because there was a lot of modifying factors because you don't, you almost never have just one neurotransmitter that's out of balance for a person. You have a mix of different things, right? So you have to look at the mix of, of things in terms of how the different neurotransmitters influence us. So if you look at the, if you look at the catecholamines, the dopamine, the norepinephrine, the epinephrine, those are real stim stimulating. So that creates the anxiety and the feeling driven and unable to relax and, you know, the, the high heart rate and the high blood pressure and all these the things. The sweating. The sweating. <laughs> All that stuff, okay, mm -hmm. and especially so if there's if there's a high norepinephrine to epinephrine ratio, that's a real significant one too. So you can test people and determine those different levels of the neurotransmitters. And if the norepinephrine is high and the epinephrine is low, if the ratio is off, mm -hmm. that creates this really agitated kind of um, a, um, overstimulation that results in nervous exhaustion. Is right. that nervous right. exhaustion similar to the type? Of um, experienced uh, that we were talking about a few moments ago from bipolar. It seems to me it's a could be a little different. I feel like I've experienced yeah. exhaustion. They are, they are a little bit different okay. in the way that they, they produce, but certainly that can contribute to it. You know, if a person has that at the same time, it makes it, it makes the bipolar pattern worse, you know. Right, because so often we're put into a single box, right? Yeah. And that's, right. that's not necessarily the case. There can be layers with all of these things. It can be bipolar and anxiety. You know, it can be depression learned, and bipolar, can, you know? <laughs> I learned so much throughout my experience and still continue. And even, it's just a spectrum. Everything's yeah. a spectrum. Yeah. You know, you're not, you don't have depression. You don't have anxiety. You don't have bipolar. You right. can't, it's not like you right. hit a threshold it's, and there you are, yeah. right? <laughs> what are your predispositions and what state are you in right now? Yeah. Right? That's, yeah, that's 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 the more accurate picture, right? Right. So then, and so then is a theme. So that the catecholamines are stimulating like that. So you have to look at that, and then um, then your acetylcholine is relaxing, that stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. So typically, uh, increased this uh, cold, what's called cholinergic tone from acetylcholine is a good thing. So it relaxes you. At the very relatively rare are people that have they are too cholinergic. And those are people who are just lethargic and they have no tone at all and they have no ambition and they just hang out. They're not really stressed, but they don't feel like doing anything. That seems so really those, static. 
What's that? that? That one seems really genetic, unless they've really just. There is, of... yeah, there is a genetic component to that for sure. But that but, that that pattern is pretty rare. You don't okay. see that very often. There can also be yeah. people who go into that after you know wearing out their yeah. system. You yeah. know, they've they've. But been... usually, usually that pattern isn't because their their acetyl their cholinergic tone is too great. Mm -hmm. But there there's a very few num few percentage of people that are too cholinergic. So they're, they just have no stimulation to their system. It's too relaxed. There's not enough tone, right? Before we talk about the other neurotransmitters, do you still do these tests, um, urine tests? Is that how you find the neurotransmitters? Yeah, so, yeah, they're, they're controversial. Some people say they're really useful. I quit using them because I only found that a few markers in them were reliable and most of them weren't. So usually when people are, usually when docs are promoting those urine tests for uh, treating people for neurotransmitter disorders, I'm not very impressed with that as a, as a way to go. It just doesn't, the, because you're testing neurotransmitters in the periphery outside of the blood brain barrier, and they don't necessarily correlate to what's going on in the central nervous system. Then what do you do? How do you test them? You really have to, you have to rely on the genetics and, and the overall pattern of your, your examination. And, and the other labs that you've run. Yeah, and other labs that you've and, run. So you have to, you have to look at, uh, it's really compiling all of the data. And also the pattern of, you know, of their mood disorder, you know, how it shows up and you can start categorizing it. Once you start working with the neurotransmitters, you can get a feel for them. You know, like I can get the feel for somebody comes in and I go, that person is histaminic. They have too much histamine overstimulating their system okay. because that person will, will be overstimulated, but they'll tend to have more headaches and they'll tend to have more gastrointestinal problems. They'll tend to have IBS, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, along with other things that are more ex exemplary of histamine. So then I know that their mood disorder is related to the histamine as opposed to, you know, the dopamine or the, the catecholamines. And then in applied kinesiology, we have a tool that we use to test for neurotransmitters as well. And it's using the meridian system. Yep. So we use beginning and ending points that are on the face, around the eyes and near the ear that correlate with, uh, well, they're based on the meridians and then correlate with different neurotransmitters depending on what we find that's out of balance. And then depending on what we find there, then we would dig deeper and figure out, you know, what the nutrition that's missing is. And one of the ways we can use the applied kinesiology is we can challenge systems. So if we think that the person might be, might have the catecholamines might be too high, we might challenge them with tyrosine, which would tend to promote that system. And we can see if it throws them out of balance. And then we can use things that bring that down and we can see if it brings them back into balance. So we can, we can challenge them in various ways and find out where they're strong, where they're weak, what, you know, what brings them into balance. You do that with smell, smell and with... taste again? Do you smell and yeah. taste? Smell, smell and taste, taste yeah. yeah. Challenging with rebreathing to see mm -hmm. how they're processing CO2, you know, to see what the mitochondrial function is, um, you know, challenge them with ammonia or chlorine and see, you know, how they're able to process through the liver with their neurotransmitters. And yeah, so there's lots of different tie-ins with the applied kinesiology. I want to point out something really important for everyone. This is why it's so important to create, establish a relationship with a yeah. medicine doctor and commit to mm -hmm. a while because you have to, you know, view where are you today and where are you next week? And you need to start seeing patterns. You need to continue lab work. And um, you just need to get to you need to get to know somebody in order to use your own intuition and your own research and knowledge in order to apply it. You can't a, go once and get a diagnosis. That's right? really, really important. Yeah. It's different than just giving a medication. And you, have just, to sort, you have to sort through the pattern for that person. Yeah. And then what the beauty of it is, I say, look, I need to work with you for a while because I need to see how you respond. That'll give me more information. I'll, I'll learn your system. Everybody's system is different. I need to learn your system. Once we figure it out and we figure out the combination for you, that combination has to do with your constitution. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's knowledge that you'll have forever then. So then those changes yeah. are profound for people, but it takes time, right? It's and it's a commitment. And, and for and a lot it, of people, it's, it's not a band-aid. It's not a band-aid, you know, it's not, it know. drugs are there for a, a purpose. You know, it's, that's a great band-aid. And that sometimes is what people need to get them over the hump, right? As they're working on other things. But it's really not a long-term solution. And you're looking at all the side effects. Whereas with working with a functional medicine doctor, you're getting real answers. And you're getting lifelong answers, you know, that are detailed and specific for you. And you know what you need to do for the rest of your life.
I love that you have this information for life. I haven't really heard it said that before, and that is really, really awesome. You always yeah, that's, make that, ultimately, always that's, ultimately that's ultimately that's the point is to figure out what the combination is for you. Yeah. Right? To get and to then, know and, it's, and it'll be based. It's based on your genetics. So then you know that you're going to use that. There might be some modifications. So that's basically what you use for the rest of your life. That's 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 knowledge in your pocket, right? That and I try and point out to a lot of people that I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, no. I can point out to a lot of people because sometimes I'm not sure if you guys what sort of insurance you take. A lot of functional medicine, um, you know, practices may yeah. or may not take different types of insurance, or maybe just yours isn't covered. And you know, maybe maybe you're going to have to pay out of pocket for a while. And for me, it's right. like, yeah, commit. I mean, you'll if you had if your car broke down, you find a way to go get a new car, right? right? right. So if you I mean, hopefully you don't have to wait for that big of a crisis for you to address your health and, and really get to know your body and, and line it up. But some people do. And just make it happen. Like invest for, you know. Right. We'll just say, we'll say six months, but I'm going to say a year. Yeah. And know that that's going to save you a ton of time and money 20 years out or 10 years oh, out. Oh, yeah. It's going to break down. Yeah. It's, it's about yeah. making yourself a priority, Right. Yeah, because you really, you really do vote with your dollars. <laughs> so what, what, what do you care about? You know, if you truly care about yourself and being healthy and well and thriving in your life, you got to put your money in that place to make that happen. Yeah. So um, then that's, uh, that's acetylcholine. We talked about histamine. Then there's serotonin. Serotonin is the one that you just feel anxious. You feel anxious, but you don't feel o overstimulated at the same time when it's Ooh. low because it calms you down it just chills the chill okay you know just kind of evens things out and then it's also the precursor for melatonin so if you're if your serotonin is low you're typically going to have problems with sleep right and have sleep disorders and sleep deprivation and these other things you're going to tend to have gut problems as well um and then melatonin because you're not in part because you're not making enough melatonin if you're sure and when you're not making enough melatonin you're not sleeping well and your body's not recovering and then your gut is affected no, well, your gut ends up affected because serotonin has a lot to do with regulating gut function. And oh. when you yeah. when you sleep, you rebuild. You know, that's the time yeah. when all of your tissues are regenerating, when your brain is getting the washing and the support that it needs from the CSF. And, you know, so all of those things happen while you're asleep. And if you're not sleeping, you're not getting that. You're constantly in a catabolic state, which means that you're breaking down. Your body's breaking down and it can't rebuild fast enough. Yeah, so a lot of mood disorders revolve around just feeling worn down, worn out, right? Not replenishing, not healing. Yeah, just ever. Dry, dry out, you know, empty. And so a lot of it revolves around that, that issue. So then that serotonin, and then you've got the, uh, the glutamate GABA. And the glutamate GABA, glutamate's extremely excite, excitatory, and the part of the brain that it excites breaks down the autonomic nervous system, and then people have trouble with their digestion, their elimination, the regulation of their hormones, and, you know, it goes on and on and on, all these different problems that they have. So when people become dysautonomic, then they have the laundry list of symptoms of things that they want answers for. But if you try to treat each of the symptoms, it's not going to go anywhere because it's not treating where it comes from, you know. It's coming from the central nervous system. You're not getting to the root. Yeah, it's not, yeah. it's not really a stomach problem. It's really, it's really in the brain is where it's coming from. What about dopamine? So, Dopamine, well, dopamine's uh, dopamine's definitely stimul stimulating, you know, and it, uh, people can feel, you know, a lot of OCD and ADD and those kind of behaviors come from overstimulation of that system, you know, feeling too driven um, and unable to relax comes from that being overstimulated. But then, uh, but then you can give uh, riboflavin, <laughs> you feel calmer and sleep better and stuff like that, you know. Being able to focus more, and, you know. Yeah, because again, it comes down to balance because dopamine really helps drive our focus, yeah. right? And our, our commitment to getting our projects done and, you know, that sort of thing. So we come back to that balance issue, yeah. you know, and, and it's, it's that reward center yeah. too, you know, but yeah. it can be overdone. Yeah, because, you know, dopamine has a lot to do with verve, you know, the sense of the line comes mm -hmm. from dopamine. So if you don't have enough, you're going to feel washed out. You know, if you have too much, you'll feel worn out, you know, ner agitated exhaustion, nervous exhaustion, you know. Where are they, what's, what's all the latest research, and maybe it doesn't even matter because it's yeah. a tight-in thing about, like, which ner uh, 
Are they produced in the gut? Are they produced in the head? Where are these all produced? <laughs> well, the, they are definitely produced in the gut, you know, and, and there is some influence on the, on the CNS. Uh, but it's again, it's a give and take thing. It's not absolute one or the other. And uh, my, um, I've actually pushed back a little bit on, on the, the gut ruling the brain idea. Okay. Um, because if you, take, if you take someone who's never had trouble with their gut their whole life and they have a traumatic brain injury, they may develop uh, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, within a few weeks of, of having a brain injury. It's the same thing with people who have, have Parkinson's disease. When they develop Parkinson's, they'll have gut problems where they never had gut problems before. And so that, you know, there's a lot of literature showing those kinds of relationships. And so um, I'm more of a brain guy. I mean, the brain has more influence on the gut than the gut has influence on the brain. You know, it does go both ways. The gut definitely has some influence because in large part, because the gut, the gut barrier, the intestinal uh, barrier and its permeability is, and all of that function that's so important. If it's, if the gut wall is too permeable, it, it causes um, inflammation throughout the body because of getting proteins across the gut wall that shouldn't get into the into the system. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, um, the the blood brain barrier can become too permeable as well. And that causes that causes a huge amount of inflammation in the central nervous system. And they often go together. And they go together. They are structured almost identical. The way the way the blood brain barrier is made and put together and functions is almost identical to the way the, the gut wall barrier functions. And so when you have issues that affect their permeability, it creates a lot of the same issues. So, so one, of the, um, one of the original tenets of chiropractic is from top down and inside out, right? So looking at the brain health first before we're looking at other stuff below, and then looking at the inside, the central nervous system, before we look at what the symptoms are on the periphery. Yeah. Right. So we're really all about the nervous system regulation and we're starting with the brain. Yeah. Yeah. So I find it makes a huge difference. So we're kind of finishing with the glutamate GABA and that's a huge one. Um, you have the one enzyme between glutamate and GABA. GABA, GABA is definitely your chill <laughs> neurotransmitter. That's the one that relaxes you the most. So it has, a, and it has a lot to do with sleep as well. So that's why like lunestin, ambient or GABA agonists, they increase GABA activity in the brain. And then the other things that do that are things like Xanax and benzodiazepines. And the diazepines, they, they stimulate GABA activity too. And those, those are the ones that just make you really chill. I mean, you're just like, oh, I feel great. I don't feel like doing anything, but I feel great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So there's a certain balance of that, right? That you oh. need to have. And so um, getting that glutamate GABA balance is important. Making sure that glutamate is regulated is really, really important. And in my opinion, that's the core of bipolar disorder is, is um, this is my opinion, even though there's a, there's a lot of research to back up my opinion about that, there's still a lot of controversy. So I call it my opinion, right? And like, based on my clinical experience and what I know about the research, and this is what I've been lecturing about, is that the core of bipolar disorder is the glutamate uh, excitation of the NMDA receptor in the limbic system. That's, that's the core of it. And so you say, have to you say that one more time for people yeah. to catch that? Sort of the, the, in my opinion, the core of bipolar disorder is overexcitation of the NMDA receptors in the limbic system of the brain by glutamate. Okay. And so getting that regulated is the core to get bipolar disorder straightened out. So I'll give you, this is, this is a gal that just, um, I think it was three weeks ago. I did a re-exam on her. Keep her in mind for one second. I want okay. to let everybody know if they want to start putting in questions, they can. I think there's little question boxes here. You could hit that and put in your questions so that we have those coming in and we can ask when we have time. Yeah, so we've got a great or, case study. To or share. you could put them in the comments box. So this is a gal that I did the re-exam on. You know, we were at three months from where we yeah. started. And so we had done a re-exam before. This is the second re-exam because I usually do them at six week intervals. And she reported to me that she was weaning off all, her, all of her bipolar medication. And she was doing fantastic and feeling better than she had since she was a kid. And she's uh, in her late 50s. And she's been on medication since she was in her teens. And it's the first time that she's felt that she could wean off her medication. So talk about the treatment. Yeah, yeah so, how, did, how did that happen? Yeah. So the, there, there are a number of variables, okay? But the, the core of this is to control the NMDA, the NMDA receptors response to glutamate, okay? 
It's partly controlling glutamate levels and it's partly controlling the, the receptor's response to glutamate. So the core of what I did for her, even though there were other variables in there, the core of what I did for her was I gave her nutritional lithium. So I gave her lithium as a trace mineral mm -hmm. and I gave her butyric acid. So uh, butyric acid it is synergistic to the effects of lithium. It promotes glutamate to GABA and it also heals the blood brain barrier. And the gut. And the gut wall barrier. So it's a real important nutrient for a lot of people in this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. And the best food source of butyric acid, butter. <laughs> so grass fed butter is gonna be a huge thing for getting yeah. that butyric acid in and that heals heals the lining of the gut, heals yeah. the lining of the brain. So eat butter, it's good for you. <laughs> I, you, don't, you have no idea how much butter I eat. <laughs> serious, I do. I'm a big proponent of like breaking, you know, like dispelling the myth of it being bad to people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I see good. so many people who self-improve uh, using butter in their diet. Mm -hmm. it's um, so anyway, that, that was the core of it. So uh, let me talk about lithium for just a minute. Yeah. So lithium is an essential trace mineral that plays a role in, in mod modulating the amount of stimulation nerves need before they fire, which is really important. So if you don't have enough lithium in the system, nerves fire with too little stimulation. So the nervous system ends up feeling like, like it's all a bare wire and it's all, it's all, you know, it's all, you know, going, going off at the same time. All the nerves are firing at all the time and you just end up fried from that. And so, um, enough lithium in the system starts to dampen it down and control it. So, so the fancy term, I'll give you the fancy term for what that is. Lithium modulates the neuron cell membrane depolarization threshold. So if you don't have enough lithium, the depolarization of the nerves happens at too little stimulation. And so it results in what I, what I call the Walmart syndrome. The Walmart, syndrome, <laughs> Walmart syndrome is you walk in there and there's all that bright light and all that noise and all that all stuff people, going on, and too many that. colors and too many people and too many conversations going on. And you're like, I got to get out of here. It's like that too overwhelming. Constantly feeling overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. So that sense of, of sensory overload, constant sensory overload, even in situations that should be really relaxed and everything that you still feel overstimulated, mm -hmm. that's, that's related to that. So. Yeah. I can attest to quite a few of those things. One, the lithium I've been on at yeah. times, um, nutritional and pharmaceutically prescribed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, butter and fat, like what, I mean, fat has been so, so, so crucial in my it diet. such a difference. Yeah. There's a, there's a relationship between, uh, between bipolar disorder and epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Well, I, and that, I'd like to talk about that. I'm on an anti-seizure medication presently. Right, right. And that's really common to that. So there's an overlap between the two. And it's been known ever since the 40s that you can control severe epileptics by putting them on a, on a high fat diet. And fish oil. You know, a ketogenic diet. Using yeah. fish, fish oil, oil is yeah. huge for mood disorders. Yeah, I've taken pharmaceutical grade, like almost like just really high, high, high doses of fish oil in the past. Yeah, and, yeah. Lot and especially the DHA. Yeah, especially the DHA that's in fish oil is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I feel like we have, you know, I would, I hope that I can continue having you back, having you back over time. Yeah. I'd love to dive in deep uh -huh. to fat. Yeah. Uh -huh. the different types of fat. Um, and also, uh, you know, what occurred to me earlier is, and maybe we could touch on this, is um, ADB. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. You know, and doing the 23andMe test, you know, like, and maybe just, can we just touch on this real quick? Like if young children, do you guys work with a lot of young people? I know yeah. Hannah is more family sure. practice. Oh yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm working with, uh, you know, no one with any mood disorders like that, but some autistic kids I've been working with recently. Okay. So, and huge things for them are going to be, you know, uh, metal detoxification because a lot of times there is a big tie-in with autism there. Um, and there's some nutritional pieces that we can hit for the detoxification. Um, and then fish oil is big for mood regulation for them as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then a lot of it comes down to, you know, uh, self-regulation, you know, getting into routines for kids and making sure that their diets, you know, enhancing their, their, life's, their life goals and, you know, what, the, what we're working on. Um, but yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it comes down to discipline, 
right? Even not just for the autistic kids, but any kids. Um, a lot of it is just having that routine and knowing what the expectations are and, you know, having them take their, their supplements, even though they'll fight for a little while <laughs> and then they get on board if they know that's part of the routine. Mm -hmm. So I think, and that, that plays in for adults as well, you know, with a lot of the, the mood disorders that we were talking about, being on a routine, making sure that you're getting up and getting dressed in the morning, you know, making sure that you're getting your exercise in, some fresh air, the sunlight, that whole gamut makes such a difference. Yeah. Which is the large part of my coaching is, is that yeah. I help people look at just their whole lifestyle and how they can refine it create routines because that lower stress you're not having to make decisions every day so many decisions every day Absolutely. you know give your brain a break you know how to incorporate the new diet that you're being recommended and the supplements and the new program that you're going to have to go on if you're working with a functional medicine doctor and how yeah. to keep all those appointments and you know what exercise is best for you yeah There's yeah so many things and there's stuff to even like the confidence of having good posture you know, yeah. retraining a person's posture, retraining them how to breathe properly, you know, how oh, many God, how yeah. effects that has, you know, down the road. And, um, you know, for, for women too, like putting on some red lipstick, you know, what does that do for your confidence, right? Yeah. For so just sure. having those things, those tools that you can use to make yourself feel better. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to, it's going to ripple out. It'll have all those ripple sure. effects on your life. Yeah. Well, and helping people find out what fun is. Yeah. What is, what is fun now? You know, we change throughout our life. And so what is fun? And we have to have it. It's just like medication, just like sunshine, just like everything else. Sure. Yep. So all of those things. Um, if you, I was going to say, um, if you, can you give an example? Let me see if there's any questions in there. I'm not sure I'm using this right. I don't mm -hmm. see any yet. Feel free to send some in anybody. Um, you kind of already said it, but in case somebody wants to have a clearer idea of what it is, like, Somebody's coming in, let's say depression, because that's a, such a big one. Somebody's coming in, they're experiencing, you know, major depression, very, you know, depression. They come in, they see you. Where do you start? Where do you go? How can you kind of paint a picture for them? Ish. Uh, well, well you, have to, you have to cover all the bases. So you, you do a full history. You do a records review. Typically, I review the last two years of, of any labs or imaging. Sometimes they go further back. Um, then you do a physical exam and the physicals, eye, ears, nose, throat, heart, lung, abdominal, orthopedic, neurological, things like phonocardiography. Sometimes you are doing heart rate variability to measure the autonomic nervous system and things of that nature. And then bring that all together. And then we're doing health questionnaires and we're grafting those into bar charts to understand what systems we need to work on and that kind of thing. Then we might be bringing in the 23andMe and doing genetic curations too and bringing that information in. So it's really where you want to you want to bring it all together and you want to correlate all that information together. So taking so that really you, wide yeah. base, you know, you make a wide base. cast. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's anything but um, allopathic in, in its approach. You know, it's not it's not here's your symptom, here's your here's your cure, you know, here's your medication for that. It's not like that at all. We want to understand the relationships between all of those things. And you, you see know. it frequently at the beginning, you space. You do, you because you have to because you have to create foundation. You know, just like you experienced when we worked together, we worked together a lot in the beginning to create the foundation and, and to clean the system up. Because when people first come, they have all these injuries that they've had that they haven't healed from. You know, most of the injuries we get over time we heal from, but we, we carry a certain amount that accumulate over time and they affect us, whether they're chemical or physical or emotional injuries. And so you have to clean those up. You know, you have to clean them up so that so that so that you shine the the you shine the gem so to speak you know so it, it shines the way it's supposed to you have to clean it up and you have to get rid of those injuries because every time we have an injury whether it's physical or chemical or emotional you know it leaves its imprint it leaves its it, its its adaptation that we have to that it changes our nature it takes us away from you know our our original nature so the idea is that you have to put a lot up in the you have to do work up in the beginning to, to address all those things. And, and to get the momentum going. And get the momentum for change. And then also, too, to reinforce the, the self-care. So part of the reason for treatment, too, being more frequent in the beginning, is to coach and reinforce the self-care that has to be in place for you to get better, right? Yeah, exactly. Because it just takes that face-to-face -face reinforcement of, you need to do this. You need to, do, you need to be doing your breathing work and show me your breathing. And if it's right, we can change it. And, 
you know, make it better and all these things, you know, are you doing your eating the way we talked about? Are you doing the exercise the way we talked about all that stuff, you know? Accountability. Yeah, yeah. accountability. At the right pace, you know, I'm sure sometimes. Yeah, not too much at once. Step back a little bit sometimes. Yeah. You're overwhelming somebody. Well, that's the thing with the, the treatments that we do as well. You can really overwhelm the nervous system, especially if someone's in a place of having some kind of mood disorder or being at that really dysregulated state, right? So we only will do maybe one cranial and one adjustment, yeah. you know, on that treatment because that's all their nervous system can handle. Yeah. If you do more than that, you're going to blow them out. You haven't accomplished anything. Yeah. The analogy is, you know, a brick laying bricks, making a brick wall, okay? You want to have everything perfectly lined up. You want to make sure everything's square. And then you lay down two rows of bricks. And then you walk away and you come back the next day. Because if you try to do three rows of bricks, mm -hmm. it's the wall is going to end up not being true. And you can't build on that. And not dry. <laughs> and not dry and all that stuff. But if you if you lay two rows of bricks and you do a, you do a perfect job doing it, and you come back, It'll be solid, and then you can build on that. Yeah, it's a yeah. lot of patience. And I, I'm going to just plug myself once again. Like, sometimes when you're embarking this way, you don't have that quick fix as yeah. the pill would be. Um, and, you know, how can we, how can you maintain confidence and inspiration and motivation in between, you yeah. know, as you practice patience and yeah. just, like, really having somebody champion you and letting, you know, encouraging you, knowing that it works yeah, and helping you, you know, relax in between because you yeah. have to try and relax in between if you really want it to work. And some people are just like, well, if I exercise more, I, I, all these things, it's like, we self-diagnose a lot because of so much information that's out there. Well, I think I should fast, you know, fasting is probably great. Everybody's doing it. You know, I think, you know, this type of exercise, so many things. And it's like, and that's, what's, and that's, that's so beautiful culture. about your work because you've walked it. Yeah. yeah. You know, you've walked the path, so you know what works. You know, you know how to, you know how it comes together. And, and the so hardest thing is to great like advocate it. for people. Yeah. And there's so much of a cultural retraining when someone's going through this process, right? Because we're so focused on pushing and doing more and being better, and I have to do and do and do, or I'm not getting anything. Exactly. And, you know, and it, it's not that way. We have to give ourselves more grace and more time and just trust that the process is happening, even if you're not doing all the time. It helps to have a trust partner. Yeah. Yeah, for okay. sure. Can I ask you, we have about five more minutes. If anybody has anything to say, shoot it our way. Um, what about, you know, somebody like me or somebody who's already on pharmaceutical, med pharmaceutical medication? How do you start to work with people that way? And do you recommend that they, how do you deal with that? Is it kind of what they want? I would like to go off medication or I'm content with what I have. I just want to see what's at the base. Like, how do you deal with that? You want to take that? Sure. The, the ideal is to, the, the, in a perfect world, you're working with the, the doc who's prescribing. Okay. And that's in a perfect world. It doesn't always happen. But then what I want, what I want to reinforce for the patient is that there's nothing wrong with medication, okay? Yeah. There's nothing, you don't, don't put a value on it. But a lot of people put this negative value on it and they have this guilt that they're taking medication, yeah. right? And I say, don't do that, okay? It's useful, okay? It, it, can be a, uh, it can be a really important part of the whole process. So don't attach this negative value to that you're taking medication. There's nothing wrong with it. But let's take it from there. Because what we want to, we want to get you to where you're self-determined and you're independent of that and you're, and, and you're able to practice self-care as being pretty much sufficient for what you need, right? And to be whole and healthy and well and, and, and to take it into a bigger context for yourself from just medication to address the symptom to, to whole health care to address your health altogether, your physical, your chemical, your emotional health and, and all of it, you know? And so... I, what I do is I have the person main, stay on their medication, okay, and then I work with them. And there's, there are some certain things you have to be really careful about because you don't want to overstimulate the serotonin system, for instance, if, if somebody's taking SSRIs. You have to be careful about how you work with people, right? Yeah. Um, but within that, you, can, you really can work with them and get them to the point where it's like, okay, now what I recommend is have a conversation with the prescribing physician for your medication of what we've been doing, how you're feeling, and how you'd like to progress. Right. I um, 
I recently had a patient come in and uh, she had decided to go on Zoloft. And it was something that she had been thinking about for a while. Um, you know, with everything going on right now, she was just feeling completely unmotivated, like she couldn't get things done. She was getting really short with her children and just, you know, wasn't feeling like she was where she wanted to be as a mom and, you know, as an individual. Um, she thought I was going to be mad at her. She thought I was going to be upset with her about making that choice, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and I, I told her that, you know, I trust her. I completely trust that she knows that that was the right decision for her. But what we need to do now that she is feeling that she has more energy and she's able to accomplish things and she's not, you know, uh, being short with her children is that we need to use this, this drug as motivation to do all of her self-care pieces, right? Totally. So now is the time to get the exercise piece on board. Now is the time to be doing your alternate nostril breathing and your meditation. And you know, this is, this is a stopgap for you for the moment until you're able to do all of those things that we've been talking about, right? And I now that you feel, feel well and can do it, do it. And then we'll see where you're at and when you're ready to come off of the drugs. So, Absolutely. you know, yeah, go ahead. I, I um, well, 100%. Thank you for giving that um, uh, example. I just got a two minute mark on there. Thank you for giving that example. I use that a lot. I say, you know, if you need something to get you out of bed and to the gym and to your doctor's office, take that. Do it. Get yeah. something to get you up to do your self care and okay. to get the, to get to the people who are going to help you get to the root. That's absolutely. I'm all for it. And even beyond, you know, like like you said, it's not bad. There's no judgment. Just as long as you're addressing the underlying issues at the same time, it's all at your own, you know, everybody in their own time. Yeah, right. exactly. Okay, so I wanted two things. So we've got uh, just a little over, over a minute. I've got your book that I can show everybody the cover of. Okay. I want to let everybody know that you can find these two at theelementsofhealth.com mm -hmm. and reach out to them. Maybe you want to start doing some work with them, you know, um, getting testing and having them review and seeing where you can go for there from there and maybe having them refer you to people in your area if you want that. Um, let me grab this book. I think you said you have a newer edition or something. Yeah, it's 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 printed so that it has spiral bound so it doesn't come it doesn't apart. apart. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So you can get that. Um, reach out to them there, Dr. Mark Forrest and Dr. Hannah Conry. My name's Nikki Aiello. Hopefully their uh, patients and clients are going to be watching this too. I'm the recovering life transition coach, I'd love to work with your people too and help them, yeah. you know, create the plan, for move sure. forward with accountability with somebody who's been there. So NikkiAiello.com, pardon me, just lost my voice. NikkiAiello.com is uh, my website. So check us all out and I'm going to record this and you can share it with people that you know. So uh, follow me on whatever and I'll send you guys this link. Wonderful. Thanks, Thanks for having us, Nikki. Thanks, Thanks you guys. Bye.